Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this Gaming in Germany webinar in which we will take a closer look at some of the interesting recent developments in the regulated German iGaming market. My name is Willem van Oort. In today's webinar, we will not only discuss the latest regulatory developments, but we will also look at relevant compliance solutions. Finally, we will focus on some potentially disruptive developments in Germany's virtual stocks market. Of course, there's only so much we can do in one brief webinar. If you would like more information, please consider attending our upcoming Gaming in Germany conference that takes place on October 16, that's in two weeks from today, at the Athlon Hotel in Berlin. Some of the convert speakers include Benjamin Schwanke, co-chair of the GGL, Pontus Lindwau, CEO of Betson, Georg Wacker, who is managing director of Toto Lotto Baden-Württemberg, Frank Schwarz, who is managing director of Spielbanken Sachsen and Sachsen Lotto, Eberhard Dürschmidt, CEO of Golden Wheel Productions and the original founder of Greentube, and many, many more. In short, we've gathered a lot of expertise and I think much relevant information will be shared. Naturally, the Gaming in Germany conference also offers excellent network opportunities and a chance to meet key decision makers. Before we kick off today's webinar, I would like to thank our strategic partners and sponsors, which you can see here listed on the screen. Thank you all very much for your generous support. We would not be able to do this without your help. Thank you. As always, also our webinars are interactive. If you would like to submit a question to one of our speakers, you can do so through the Slido app. To use Slido, please scan the QR code on the screen here in front of you on the left. Next, enter the event code GIG, hashtag GIG. Finally, select the Q&A tab on top of your screen and you can put your questions uh, there. These questions will be addressed and if possible answered during the audience Q&A at the end of this webinar. With us today, we have three expert speakers. Dr. Jörg Hoffmann, senior partner at Melga's law firm. Jochen Bieber, managing director of Chevron Group and Robert Lenshover, CEO of Hulle Games. Gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. I'm very glad to have you. Let's go to the first speaker of today, Dr. Jörg Hoffmann, senior partner at Melchers Law Firm. Jörg, how are you? Thank you for participating today. I just have returned from holiday, so I'm very well, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Jörg. Jörg, we all know that you keep a close track of what's happening in the German iGaming market. Have there been any significant regulatory developments in the last month? Well, of course, everybody knows 2023 is a new era. It's the beginning of the responsibility of GGL, the new regulator in Germany. And I could endlessly talk about what happened this year because it's been a lot, of course. But I will focus on some, let, let's say, some more interesting details which happened during the last couple of weeks. And maybe we will also look at the state of affairs. Uh, we have this whitelist in Germany where you find every license operator being listed on this whitelist. And if you're not listed there, you are considered to be an illegal operator and will be target of uh, due to enforcement actions, of course. At the moment, uh, as of um, 29th September, we have 31 sports betting operators listed on the whitelist, uh, 40 operators with licenses for virtual slot machines, and five for online poker. There are zero licenses uh, granted to online casinos so far, which is more or less subject to the state legislation and state regulation, meaning at the moment there is no legal offering for um, roulette, baccarat, blackjack, the bank holder games or live casino games. And uh, I think this will not be the case prior to next year. Uh, we also are in the process of um, application proceedings regarding the permission of uh, single games to be offered as virtual slots under your license. We have a system where you cannot only use the license for to operate and broker these games. You also need a prior approval of every single game. That takes time and uh, I don't have the, 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 the concrete figures, but I estimate there's around maybe 300 games been um, permitted so far. That is some shocking news because there should be some thousand games on the market. On the black market, of course, you will find more than 5,000 markets 
being offered and being demanded. One reason why we're still waiting is that the capacity of the authority in terms of manpower is still not sufficient. Uh, there is a budget for 110 full-time positions and to my knowledge we have 68 people working uh, at the GDL and not all of them are full-time employed so it takes time and the main problem of course is that every game must be approved for each operator so even if a very popular game has been approved for 10 times if number 11 comes and said I want to offer the same one same random release number um, the case handlers have to deal with it and check it and uh, list all these results and protocol. That is time demanding. Uh, in order to get some more pressure on the, the industry publishers, for instance, uh, where there's still a lack of compliance with the, the guidance and the, uh, um, well, the, the demands of the interstate treaty, uh, GDL contacted the operators, told them uh, they're spending applications. We want you to clarify things. We want you to deal with uh, those non-fixed items we do have. So they're putting pressure on the studios by way of contacting the operators. Um, it's what it is, and so we still have to wait until they will all be um, they will all be approved. What can we see in terms of, of, of action? Maybe we see that there is more enforcement action uh, brought and, and initiated by GGL at the moment against illegal operators, meaning those who are not on the white list, but also supporting of um, illegal gains. This could be advertising, affiliate business, payment service providers. They are on the target. They are a target and on the radar of the authority. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen more and more activities being initiated by GDL, which we appreciate because it's very important that the license market will be protected against black market operators. Thank you, Jörg. That was very clarifying. Um, second question, Jörg, and if you could speak up a little bit, that would be nice. What can you tell us about the recent activities of the GGL? What are they working on? Well, apart from the enforcement activities, uh, we've seen some changes of the, the betting program most recently. The betting program is sort of a catalog which is published at the website of GGL, where you can see uh, which betting markets and which sporting events uh, are allowed to be to 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 be placed bet on, and uh, it is a list which is um, very detailed. You can simply Google GGL and then try to find your way through uh, these publications. And um, during the last couple of days, we've seen that there have been added some new bet types or new competitions in football and basketball, which is highly appreciated. But at the same time. Uh, some realized that a few competitions in basketball and football has been removed. So uh, the question is, is this coincidentally or uh, is that uh, something which is simply done by GTL without prior notice uh, to the industry? Uh, I think the Sports Betting Association, uh, the DSVV, is going to contact the regulator and seek for clarification. It's probably something which has been which has been made unintentionally, but however, we see it makes sense from time to time to look at these lists and make sure you are updated because every bet needs to be every category and every bet type and event needs to be approved for every operator before it's going to offer it. And if a list is not mentioned, no, a bet is not mentioned on that list, it would be an illegal offering, even if it's basically allowed to offer it. It must be permitted in advance. We've also seen that, and we waited a long time for that, that uh, the regulator now approved the increase of cross-operator deposit limits for the virtual slots as well. So far, it was only part of the license for sports betting operators. The increase is permissible up to 30,000 euros per player per month on a cross-operator basis. And it also means um, that um, we have a new system of monitoring, which is more advanced they have to carry out a very detailed monitoring if it's up to um, 10,000 euros, a deviation from the standard limit, which is only 1,000 euros. And also uh, there is a mandatory um, monthly loss limit to be set of no more than 20% of the individually set stake limit. The stake limit can be set by a player, but that's not mandatory. So if there's no stake limit, there will be no loss limit, however. And if it's more than 10,000, between 10,000 and 30,000, 
the player must be 24, 21 years old, and uh, there's an obligation to set uh, these exemptions for no more than 1% of the players active with the single license holder, uh, based maybe on the previous three months average uh, of active players. How this could be working, I have no idea. You also have to consider this is with the operator who grants the limit, who grants the extension, and then the player can decide where to play. If he leaves this operator, plays somewhere else, the new operator will have no monitoring obligation about his limits. So I think this is something uh, which needs to be questioned. It makes no sense in a practical way. But we had this discussion one or two years ago. And also there is more observing indications um, of problem gambling behavior. For instance, if someone uses more than one credit card in 28 days, this should be questioned and should be checked. Finally, I have to mention the Lucas Safe Server. Um, is ready to be connected. There was a three months deadline that expired uh, by the end of last month. And I think it's 26, uh, so it's now passed. And it's to be expected that GGL will examine the state of affairs by contacting the operators, initiate some hearings, and hopefully set enough time for a statement. This is what happened just recently, summarizing. Okay. Thank you for the update, uh, Jörg. Much appreciated. In the meantime, uh, to all the people at the point your screen, go to the Q&A tab and submit your questions to Jörg and the other speakers uh, of the webinar later. And as said, at the end of the webinar, we will have a look at those questions. For our next couple of questions, we'll turn to Jochen Beaver, who is Managing Director of Chevron Group. Welcome, Jochen, and thank you for being here. Jochen, we don't hear you. Do you hear me? <laughs> Thank you for having me. You kept the suspense. Very nice. Uh, welcome, uh, Jochen. <laughs> um, Jochen, we all know that the German market is highly regulated and that compliance is very important. With that in mind, what are some of the exciting things happening in compliance right now? Can you tell us about that? As, uh, as Jörg already mentioned, there were uh, the first fines uh, issued uh, to operators uh, and the costs of compliance are rising, uh, especially for the operators uh, who are operating not just in one market, uh, but also in other markets. Um, so uh, with the low margin on the, uh, on the German market, uh, also in, in regards to the, especially to the tax on uh, virtual slot machines, it is very important uh, to keep the cost for compliance as, uh, as low as possible. And so what we see now is that more and more operators uh, are uh, setting up compliance management systems um, for uh, one central system, uh, which is uh, then can be used for all jurisdictions uh, to have more control over, uh, over the costs uh, and um, being also more uh, compliant um, in, in all jurisdictions uh, and to avoid defines which were uh, uh, not just issued on the German market, but also, for example, on the Dutch market. Okay. This, the, Thank uh, you, Jochen. That was very, uh, very helpful. Sorry. I just want to say that then, that there are also now coming up some new regulations uh, um, in uh, outside of the uh, European Union and uh, that uh, the operators uh, now uh, looking also abroad, not just in the US, but also in Dubai or um, Curaçao is coming, came up with a new regulation, um, same as Gibraltar. Okay, thank you, Jochen. And for the next question, if you could speak up a little bit, that would be uh, great. Continue, Jochen, what can you tell us about recent developments in KYC and AML solutions? Here, the, uh, Jörg mentioned already that the deposit limit can be uh, can be risen uh, for players, and uh, here uh, the play operators need to ensure that the raise of the limit is not um, AML related. So a clear monitoring system needs to be in place, uh, and that's something uh, which can be a challenge for especially smaller operators uh, because the cost for uh, for these kind of monitoring systems can be quite high. And then uh, the operator needs to ensure that the, that uh, actually the uh, monitoring system is effective. Um, the second um, interesting 
development on the market is uh, that uh, uh, it makes almost no sense to connect to, to single KYC solutions. Uh, now, uh, there are uh, several aggregators on the market uh, offering international solutions where um, localized KYC uh, solutions are integrated uh, and can be delivered through one API. So, uh, so here um, it seems like that uh, specialized local solutions might, uh, might not be the future anymore. Thank you, Johan. Very, very interesting. Another area where we can exploit development is e-money. So, Jochen, what can we expect from this and how should this be managed from a compliance perspective? Um, in, on the Italian market, uh, e-money is uh, since a long time very well known. It's a possibility uh, to top up and uh, withdraw money from uh, online accounts um, in, uh, in, an, uh, in retail business. So it means that it's possible uh, now outside of betting shops uh, to accept cash and uh, also to pay out in cash from online accounts. Uh, so this means that the relation between the betting shop and uh, the operator changes. Uh, it's not a retail bet anymore. Uh, the, the, um, the betting shop become, becomes uh, an e-money agent uh, and uh, with a new contract with an um, e-money solution provider, e-money licensee, uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, players who were players of the retail business before become online players and also the, uh, the commission agreement needs to change so, so that the betting shops uh, are becoming so-called retail affiliates so affiliates of the of the online business, and uh, it's not a relation between um, a retail relation uh, between the betting shop and the operator anymore. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. That brings us to the the last question to you, Jochen. Um, what is alternative dispute resolution, and what are its uh, advantages as the last topic for you today? Um, all e-commerce companies are obliged uh, to have a link to the online dispute resolution portal of the EU. There's a list of, uh, of alternative dispute resolution providers. Um, and um, I can speak from our own experience because we are uh, from the EU Commission licensed uh, alternative dispute resolution provider uh, in Malta. In Malta, uh, the regulation requires uh, to have a contract with an ADR, uh, as also in Italy or in some other jurisdictions. And um, ADRs are pre-trial, pre-court um, uh, mediators. Uh, so we receive complaints from players and then uh, we try to solve the complaint before it comes to a court case, which can be really difficult for, uh, for players uh, to have a court case, for example, in Malta, and also for the operators to have a court case in the in the country of residence of the player. And um, um, we are going to present the um, the statistics of the last five years uh, at the conference, and I think it will be uh, quite interesting for operators to see how they could enhance their CRM to players, because a lot of the uh, complaints were misunderstandings um, between, for example, uh, on on bonus uh, um, between the operators and the players. Uh, that's quite interesting. Um, and I think I should mention at this point that there will be a breakout session separate from the main program at the upcoming uh, conference dedicated to these specific topics. These breakout sessions will be prov provide a very specific, very detailed information and will be hosted by trained experts from Chevron consultants. Before we move, move to the next couple of questions, uh, please don't forget that you can submit your questions to Slido, point your camera to the QR code, go to the Q&A tab and ask your questions that we hopefully then can answer at the end of the session. Thank you, Jochen. Thank you, Jochen. We're going back to Jörg Hoffman just for a small intermezzo before we uh, ask the questions to Robert Lenzhoven. Jörg, welcome back again. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, some potentially disruptive developments in Germany's virtual stocks market are taking place right now. Local, publicly owned lottery operators or private may take significant inroads in this market in the not too distant fu future, or some already have. And before we start looking at this from a business perspective with Robert, I think it's good to set the stage and talk a bit about German lottery regulation. To tell us more, 
we brought Jörg back. Jörg, welcome back. Uh, Jörg, could you please briefly explain how German lotteries are regulated and what advantages do they have over other gambling operators? It's an easy and a short answer. In principle, we can say that lotteries are still subject to the German state monopoly. So far, only state-owned companies can offer lottery products, basically. There are only minor exceptions available, for instance, for so-called lotteries with low risk potential, such as Aktion Mensch, which could be named one of them, the postcode lottery, or for profit-saving associations, so-called Gewinnsparvereine. Good courses are also part of these minor lottery exemptions. Uh, this can be done by private uh, operators as well. Um, also, you can, as a private operator, you can apply for a license to commercially broker products of state-run lotteries in Germany, which means German lotteries, not foreign lotteries, of course. And this is available under certain um, regulation. Um, the advantages, of course, as a lottery um, operator, you have this totalizer principle. So uh, that is this fixed price schedule based on revenue means there is no risk of loss, which is a big, a big, big, big advantage, of course, for every lottery operator. You don't have that in the regular gambling market and the, the, with the other operators. Uh, also, the regulation is um, not as, as, as detailed and enormous like for um, uh, other operators. Not every section of the interstate treaty applies for lotteries and lotteries are allowed to offer jackpots. Virtual slot machine operators and sports betting operators and whoever got licenses and is whitelisted, they're not allowed to, to work with jackpots, not even name it like that uh, or do something which looks like a jackpot. Um, lotteries op lot lottery operators, even if they are state owned and run by the state, are not exempted from slots licensing business. So they can apply for a slots license and if they meet the um, requirements, and of course they do, they can get these licenses. We have two present uh, examples for this, the Lotto Hesse and the lottery Lotto Baden-Württemberg. They both were whitelisted for virtual slot machine games. So every lottery operator in Germany can make its own decision. It's not a federal business, it's a state-by-state -state business. And we have these two examples at the moment. It's competition, but of course, everybody can compete. Thank you, Jörg. I think that sets the tone perfectly for the next uh, speaker. Just a quick reminder, um, if you have questions to Jörg or any of the other speakers, please point your camera to the QR code and ask questions. The more the merrier, uh, because we like interaction and uh, questions to the expert speaker here. So, welcoming today's final speaker, Robert Lenzhover, who is CEO of Hölle Games. How are you, Robert? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, all good. A pleasure, a pleasure. So after the uh, introduction from Jörg, and as mentioned before, the topic is lottery operators and virtual slots, which is something that you are closely involved with. So from your perspective, how could lottery operators disrupt potentially Germany's virtual slots market? Um, we all know Germany is quite a tough market and sort of every uh, significant area where we can all help and from a business perspective participate to also help this channelization is is vital um, otherwise um, the market development um, um, further market development is not very fruitful perhaps um, and um, lotteries um, obviously play a huge role because they have a um, massive acceptance in in the in the um, in the uh, in the general public, let's say, um, depending on which country you look at, 40-50% um, of um, people um, buy a lottery ticket uh, every year uh, of, the, of the adult population. So you have quite a huge pool of people um, who are uh, participating in lotteries. It's going to good causes, uh, it's supporting um, um, sport and other areas of the society. Um, and um, and what, what has happened um, um, uh, recently um, is that um, besides uh, whitelisting of uh, Lotto Baden-Württemberg and Lotto Hessen, also a uh, the market leader in terms of reselling has gotten a license um, seal uh, with their properties in Germany called Lotto 24 and uh, Tip 24. 
And um, I think that's um, that's one of the, let's say, better signals um, coming out of the regulation that um, as a private company, um, you are able to speak to the German audience with a lottery proposition. So you can offer on a reseller basis uh, with uh, slim margins, but still obviously possible to work profitably. Um, Seal is a public company, so the numbers are, uh, are visible um, that it's possible to operate highly profitable in the German market with lottery alone. And it was always the case that if there is a um, possibility to cross sell in, 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 in a responsible manner, but cross sell nevertheless to a um, to slots or other gaming products, that this is a very desired um, sort of uh, property to have. And um, um, it's disruptive in the sense that um, the acceptance um, will rise. Um, so I, I did some, let's call it uh, local market research recently uh, in Berlin and asked people literally in kiosks and other areas um, why they don't gamble online or if they gamble online. And many still believe it's uh, still illegal or it's you know not quite right or they were unsure about legality. And I think the lotteries play, besides this being a business opportunity, they play a vital role in um, um, communication that this vertical of virtual slots um, is now a legal offering possible. Um, and uh, also obviously um, by being able to capture um, large audiences, um, hopefully um, over time, we will see the next 12 months, 24 months, um, they will play a key role, um, especially the states, I think, um, and also obviously private companies, a key role in um, helping with journalization. Um, just some, some like, just to give perspective, I mean, there's 80 million people um, in uh, more than that in, in Germany total, and SEAL has a reach of 1 million monthly um, active users. So it's quite a massive base who um, is exposed now also to this, let's call it information um, and obviously product. Um, so that's very disruptive. And I think I've been saying this for like two, three years to to look at that a little bit for iGaming operators. I think it will be interesting to see what um, non-lotto companies, iGaming companies, um, um, companies we all know, um, might look at this vertically in the future and say that's interesting because um, it, will, it can provide an interesting funnel from acquiring a lotto customer, which is a lot cheaper than acquiring a, a slots customer. Um, hopefully it will be profitable just on a lottery basis and then ability to cross sell. Um, there's limitations what you're allowed to do in cross selling, very, very limited, um, but it still works in principle. So I think some iGaming companies will pick this up and look at this and we might see more um, companies um, uh, entering this vertical. So I think that's quite a unique situation in Europe for private companies, because where else in Europe, it's not many really, where you are able as a private company to offer lotto, market lotto, um, and also offer virtual slots. So I think that's maybe a little bit of a positive gem uh, or maybe a big positive gem um, in the German iGaming market, uh, let's say. Yeah, okay, thank you, Robert. That was very uh, interesting. Now, now, Robert, that we have established that lottery operators could disrupt the virtual slots market. Do you see indications that this is actually happening? And I, I know you gave some examples, but uh, any further thoughts? I think, um, 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 we see it by execution of or by by actually it happening um, because you know a lot of uh, things the last years in regulation we have seen it in, in in germany and in other countries that you know people are hopeful that certain things are happening but only once you see it you start believing it and i think the fact that um there's now three lot to comp two state lotteries and one private um lottery company reseller company Having a license on the whitelist is, is one thing. Um, one of those only so far is live, which is sealed with tip 24. So that's a big signal because there's a lot of, um, besides what's written in the, um, in the state, state treaty, each, uh, license holder gets so-called Nebenbestimmungen. So like a side letter, um, to adhere to certain, uh, more granular ruling and rules, let's say, in order to be allowed to offer, um, this, um, these services, these products. And the fact that it's happened that now um, two game suppliers um, are live um, um, with, um, with Seal, um, that they're operating since a few months, I think that's 
that's the obviously the strongest signal that it can be done, that it is being done, and that it's um, um, that it's something that's that's an interesting vertical to look at in the future. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, Robert, thank you very much, and you certainly have given us something to uh, think about here. Again, this topic will be explored in greater detail together with you, Robert, at the conference coming up in uh, two weeks, where we have two state lottery executives as well as a representative from Zeal to share their thoughts on the issue. Uh, before we move on to the audience Q&A, quick one, if you have any questions to Robert, use the QR code, go to Slido and ask the question in the uh, app there. That brings us to Q&A part of the session exactly at 3.30, so impeccable, impeccable timing. Um, and we've seen questions coming in from the audience and we would like to look at the first one, please. From an anonymous viewer here, how well are the cross operator deposit limits working from a technical and operational perspective? We don't really have technical and operation uh, uh, experts on board here, but I'm looking at you, Jochen, here, because compliance uh, delivers part of that uh, requirement. And any thoughts on this, the deposit limits? Or Jörg? Uh, yes, now that, uh, that everyone uh, needs to be connected to Lubras finally, uh, the, the cross operator deposit limits uh, will work uh, in the future. It's a, it's, um, it's a unique situation in the European or even worldwide market how the Lubras system is, uh, is structured that the uh, limits can be risen by one operator and it can, it can be used by another one. So uh, this is something uh, we the, the future will show uh, how um, how good this will work uh, if all uh, deposits will be uh, then uh, uh, or change of deposit limits will be sent to Lugas immediately. But uh, I think at the moment it's a bit early uh, to answer this question from an operational perspective. And one thing to add, uh, with sports betting, we don't have that complicated regulation as it turned out to be uh, with virtual slots. And so basically, technically, it works. You can submit the data to Lugas. Lugas will check and respond, which works cross operator base. But if we have these new ancillary provisions, including the 1% active player clause or the 20% loss limit, if there is a, um, a stake limit, which I said is not mandatory, this looks too complicated to me, and we have to wait and see how this will be performing technically and operationally based. Great, thank you, Jörg. Um, great, let's go to the second question from the audience here. Very practical questions. Uh, at least the first part is easy. How many lottery operators have applied for a virtual slot license, and which one? I think you mentioned them, Robert, or you, Jörg. And I mentioned um, the two that have got a license, which is um, Lotto Hesse and Lotto Baden-Württemberg. We cannot give any information on how many pending proceedings are there because this will never be published by GGL. It's under disclosure if there are more, but these are confirmed. And it's worked for okay. slot pushing. So it's two and a work in progress. I guess we see the coming months um, what will come out of uh, this. Let's move to the next question from the audience. I guess that's one for Jochen. Jochen, how is the independence of the ADR mechanism being guaranteed? So the alternative dispute resolution mechanism. Well, in, uh, in countries where there is a, uh, where the regulation requires to have a contract with an ADR, uh, the player can always uh, send a complaint uh, to the regulator, which is like the central ADR of the, uh, of the, uh, of, uh, the country, uh, if uh, the player would not be happy with the mitigation of the uh, AT, a private AP, uh, ADR, so to say. Uh, and um, as far as, as I'm aware, uh, there are only independent uh, ADRs on the market which are not connected to any operator. I guess that uh, answers that. Thank you, Jochen. I guess there's a fourth question. Let's do that as a last question to wrap up this webinar here. 
And the question is how many requests for limit increase have been approved so far for virtual slot machine operators? So limit increase for virtual slot machine operators. I guess we're looking at you for this year. Yeah, uh, there's no published data available, of course, because every operator receives its own letter. Uh, to my knowledge, GGL sent these letters at the same time, and I would make the guess that every operator who is whitelisted uh, made a request for an increase, and I guess it will all be the same. So probably it's them all, the 40s, which we can find on the whitelist. Thank you, Jörg. Um... I guess not much else to offer here. I guess these were four excellent questions. And with that, I would like to wrap up the webinar here as we run out of time. Thank you, Jörg, Jochen and Robert for sharing your thoughts, your expert third and answering our viewers' questions. I'm certain that your insights were very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Of course, as I mentioned before, there will be more to discuss at the upcoming Gaming in Germany conference. That's in two weeks from now. If you want to hear directly from the co-chair of the Gemeinsame Glücksspielbehörde der Länder, as well as other major stakeholders, this event is not to be missed. This conference is also the place to meet key decision makers in the German gambling market. Registration for the conference is open on the website gamingingermany.com, and I sincerely hope to see you all in person in Berlin in two weeks. With this, we've come to the end of this Gaming in Germany webinar. I hope you found it useful. A link to a full recording of today's webinar will be shared in the post-webinar email that we will be sending out as soon as possible. As always, let's keep in touch. If you haven't signed up for free newsletters and the print magazines, please do so at our website, gamingin.eu. That's gamingin.eu. Let's stay in touch and see you next time. Thank you very much.